Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Both Sides podcast. I'm really excited today because I've got a fellow buyer's agent with us, Matt Schrama, who owns the Schrama Group. He's a phenomenal buyer's agent and also a high integrity champion bloke with a good track record as a football professional as well as a buyer's agent. So, Matt, I'm really excited because I get to speak with a fellow buyer's agent. Um, mate, the first thing that comes to mind with you is you're presented really well in this all black attire. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the thought pattern and the design behind that? Yeah, lo- love that. Lads, thanks for having me. First of all, I, uh, you're welcome. Big fan. I'm a big potty consumer and uh, you're, yours definitely up there. So, pleasure to be on. And yeah, bro, it's funny. First thing you said to me when I see you, know, I, I tell you what that tells me about about you mate is um attention to detail i don't know i always know because i say that to people i'm like hey bro like just want to admire like the cuff on your, your ankles there it's measured like to a t you know and i don't know when people say to me it's like yeah this person knows like they've got things lined up so um uh, but bro it's funny uh, a lot of people ask that with the black thing bro oh, i don't know i i love business and i love looking up to entrepreneurs and things like i'm all about a, a life hack or mm. you know saving time energy less thoughts and you know the old steve jobs and hormozy and some of the people i've always looked up to in business they're always trying to minimize decisions and then yeah just one day i was like i'm just going to try and eliminate decisions out of my wardrobe so i just decided yeah just go everything all all black i wear the same same uh and, it, and it's easy to repurchase things too i already know it's all saved in on the app so Ready is it actually the same jacket, same pants, same shirt every single day? Pretty much, yeah. Love yeah, it. Yeah, it's definitely same pants, same shirt. That's a Josh Vegan move. Is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a Josh yeah. Vegan move. Yeah, same same size, um, everything. So I kind of don't ever need it. If I need new ones as well, it's the same. So and The only thing that changes is when you get bigger biceps. If I, if I, go, on a, if I go on the bulk, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, the but bulk, yeah. <laughs> I keep things pretty steady now that footy's finished, yeah. Um, yeah. Can we start off there? Like I... The buyer's agency stuff's cool, but I really want to know about this NRL career, how you've obviously, you've applied the same disciplines because to, to become a professional athlete, we know um, Josh Green that, mm. that plays for the Dallas Mavericks at the moment and the discipline that he has, even when he came back to Australia last year while he was on holidays, he had his you know, trainer cancel his ho- holiday in Spain to come train him. The discipline is next level. How has... How's that translated from being an NRL player of seven years to now becoming an entrepreneur and buyer's agent? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd say if I was to reflect back, probably the three biggest things I've taken away from athlete to business, number one, you've nailed on the head, is, is discipline. I, like I reflect back, like it's kind of literally ingrained in you every day. Like you have to get up your trainings at this time so you got to get yourself out of bed if you're what not times, there, what times wake up for you now these days it's four, four. always four wow. yeah yeah a, uh, eight's the goal always so wow. i always try to track my track my sleep i like your i like you already yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i know your routine man we can go into that later but um yeah so when i was playing footy it, the discipline muscle was always on flex because again you, if you don't make it to training you know you know you lose your spot your career is kind of out there so that and then you know you're into your first session um the discipline to compete yeah. and then you know you finish and then you got to do the discipline to do your recovery in your ice mm. bath and take your protein shake and bro, your meals are all planned out. you have to eat the right meals and then so it's this constant and that's one day and then you just do that over a whole pre-season year after year it's just your whole career it's just a discipline game like the whole thing so that's definitely number one that transferred into business because i believe with business now the biggest thing of it it's i believe you know not not all of it is is skill it's it's, a lot of it is just discipline and doing the simple things um number two would definitely be energy Mm. like really prioritizing energy and how that affects your performance again as a as a athlete full-time you know, if you're on the piss every single day and rocking up to training, it's it's going to show. So uh, same thing in business, you know, I, I felt you can apply the exact same thing. If you're coming in with a mm. healthy mind, uh, you're coming in with a strong start ahead of the competition. And then I think the third is being regimented. So as an athlete, you know, we used to get these PDF documents, your whole month's kind of mapped out. It says, you know, warriors on saturday so we know friday's captain's run and we know our flights on thursday we're having lunch at this time before the flight 
you know, we have our hydration gels at this time. Um, we wear this shirt. You wear your blue polo on the plane. You wear your white polo at captain. So it was just like everything was mapped out. Um, the hardest thing, though, where athletes fail is none of that's provided when you're in the real world. Mm, yeah. So it's back on you to make it happen. And I feel athletes go two ways. Um, I was really fortunate. I felt as nearly like an OCD thing for me where I felt like I wasn't at my best unless I was structured. It was kind of just ingrained from a young age. But you, again, we've all seen it. Like athletes go the complete opposite where it's like finally my career's finished. I can kind of let the, let the valve release and go hard and do other things, you know. Yeah. So that, they're the probably biggest three things, discipline, energy and schedule. When you talk about the discipline piece from your experience as a top performing athlete and now a business owner, where do you feel people go wrong or from your experience you struggled with maintaining that? Yeah. I reckon it's the ability to play the long game. Ooh, the long yeah, game. Yeah, the ability to delay your time horizon on success as well. Again, I reflect back on a career, right, on a footy career. All of those kids that are playing – um, right now at five, six years old. The, the, real, the realis- realistic truth is 100% of them probably want to play first grade, but 0.001% will actually get there. And I remember we're at an under-14s carnival and that, that was the stat they spat out. Wow. I was playing representing MetWest, shout out to the, the, the hood. And, <laughs> um, and yeah, I represented Met West, which is a big achievement for me back in the day. And then we got to State Carnival and yeah, they said that, uh, they were really honest. They were just like, honestly, probably there's probably three of you in this whole tournament that will go on to play in around. And there's thousands of us. Wow. So it, it's kind of like, okay, that's that's the real realistic nature of it. But then what I started to realize as the years went on, age 16, 17, 18, you know, a few fall away, a few making state teams and they fall away. I realize, you know, talent will only get you so far and it sounds cliche, but I, I do realize if you're just willing to just stick it out and just keep enjoying what you're doing, it, it does get there. Like the amount of kids I've seen who were way more talented but opted to take a different path and probably lack discipline in key areas, like maybe had the shortcut of doing certain things on a Friday, Saturday night instead of another thing, mm. um, choosing choices with their food, um, just – just the smallest of things like that, I, I just think it comes down to playing the long game. Uh, I'm so big on even in business, like I consider myself still new in business. I've got so much more learning to do and I, I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm keen to test out where the next 10 years is going to take me. So I don't really judge my success anymore on on a year thing because, again, we, as an athlete, a lot of them played since they're five. So that's a cumulative probably 20 years of of just doing the same thing yeah. for 20 years, yeah. How hard was that transition from being an NRL athlete to now um, being a business owner? Did you go straight to being a business owner? No, no, not at all, actually. I, um, To be honest, it was probably the hardest point of my life, like one of the hardest points. Like, And as I unpack it, I, I realised my identity, my identity was attached to being a professional athlete. And mm. it's good knowing what I know now because I've done a lot of work on myself. But I, I, I a few Guingana troops, eh? Yeah, a few Guingana troops, a few Tony Robbins. How good's Tony uh, Robbins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dean Graziosi, man, I'm a self development fiend. And and to be honest, I got into all of that when I was struggling. It, it really was uh, because it. You, I, I got medically retired too, so I retired at the age of uh, 27. Yeah. So for me, you know, I, I debuted at 19. Um, 20 and then played till 27 you know I'd, I'd every aspiration to play to a minimum 33 to 35 so for it to be cut short and doctors telling you you know you need to retire um, what happened do you mind me asking yeah no nah, it was just accumulate i had nine surgeries in about three years whoa Fuck. yeah so it was That's a, intense yeah so it was, it was my first three years was epic you know new kid on the block yeah. you know rookie of the year won a, a heaps of these awards and um, you know, you get all the, the articles about you, all those things, you know, and as a young kid, you think you're the man. And then, you know, uh, yeah, a few injuries started rolling in. And, yeah, it was really, really tough because I was always big on my um, recovery. Mm. So I, still to this day, it was just some of those unlucky ones. Like I, I never had a soft tissue injury. So like hammies and because I always looked after, but they were just big 
reconstruction. So I had three shoulder recos, wow. uh, hip cam lesion where they shave your hip joint. Uh, ACL reconstruction, three ankle cleanouts, compound fracture of my finger. Um, so yeah, that all happened in like. So it was a case of getting back from injury, playing one or two games, and then boom, back shoulder from, Rico, back out. And very then, Ryan Pappenhausen, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was a bit like that. Yeah, a bit of a journey, and I, I, I really relate to any athlete who goes through the the ups and downs. But yeah, that was kind of that that journey which mm-hmm. led to being medically retired. Um, but yeah, my, my identity was, it was all over new. So that's why I sort of said how it was so tough because my identity was, I was an athlete Mm. and it's kind of being taken away from you. How did you learn how to detach yourself from being an athlete to going, okay, now I'm going to be something else. Mm. How did you do that mentally? Well, I remember I listened to some Tony Robbins stuff actually that really spoke to me and there was, he calls it like your blueprint and we've all got a blueprint in life, right? And if you reflect on each individual and anyone listening to this would have some sort of blueprint, what they think the next five, 10 years is we've got goals, aspirations. The thing is in life, sometimes that blueprint doesn't go to plan and sometimes it's not by our choice. And in that exact moment when your blueprint doesn't match what you planned, we either do two things. We blame or we accept. And scientifically proven that you know majority of people actually could fall into blame myself included i did that too so we just naturally as human beings fall into blame because how could this happen to me like it's not i didn't plan this um so in that moment i think the first thing is accepting that hey this has happened you can't really change it Um, but the key is the ability to grab the pen back and create a new blueprint and Mm. that's where the work happens of you know, creating something new. And one of my favorite sayings that I definitely live by is that life will always open up doors. It's our job to walk through them and life will close the ones we're not meant to continue to walk through. I love that. Yeah. And, it, and it's really helped me move forward each time in life because what I realize is you can never connect the dots forwards. You can always connect them backwards. Always. Like, and, and it's just crazy. Like, and, and it's so true because where I am sitting right now would have never been in my blueprint back then. But it's just like a few doors open up on the journey. And it's like, fuck it, I'm just going to walk through it, see what happens. And then um, each thing leads leads to another. So anyone who's going through that right now, they might be a bit stuck. It's like, man, don't be one of the people who don't move forward and don't do anything. That's mm. the feeling of stuck. Yeah. But you will get times where a door will open. Sometimes you just got to walk through it. And life will just close if it's not meant to continue to stay open. Yeah, I'm seeing that throughout my own life at the moment, like doors closing, but new opportunities are opening that are probably better that I never really thought were there before, right? Exactly, yeah. So, um, and and one of the biggest things is, yeah, self-improvement. I'm just feeding my head and brain with just Mm. self-development books, this, Mm. that. Is that how you overcame your like that that career change or, or detachment of of who you thought you were yeah it was it was definitely one like do, uh, you know the old saying doing the work i think it was yeah. number one but one book that actually really i stumbled across on the path in that journey was called the miracle morning the hal, miracle morning yeah hal elrod the miracle morning and um i was always a i'm an efficiency guy so i actually digested the audio audio and uh the the summary on youtube so i can't say i've read the paperback front to back but i understand the whole concept of it anyways that's um the miracle morning just like his story is insane like he nearly died i think twice and just just some crazy stuff like it went broke and then what got it back and then went broke again anyways cool story how odd but there's the basis of the book is just developing a, a miracle morning Mm. like it sounds great but we'll listen to it on the way home yeah yeah but that that kind of and i know you guys would relate to it because you're in self development but the ability to create a a a bulletproof start to each day and realizing that each day isn't isn't assured as well is where where it's at so i think during those hard times where i was transitioning it was just like look each day is an opportunity like what an opportunity I got to even play footy. So a lot of gratitudes, you know, the stuff we all mm. know, but I think it's actually executing it and getting amongst it properly. Mm. And there's a key concept in the book he calls on savers, S-A-V-E-R-E-R-S. So 
scribing, affirmation, visualizations, exercise, reading, and solitude. So wow. just some, and, and it's just kind of creating your miracle morning that includes parts of that. Could be could be thirty minutes, could be four hours. So what does your miracle morning look like now? For example. Oh, bro, do you want to go? Do you want to go depth or just depth? Oh, no. Depth. <laughs> deep. Bro, anyone who knows me personally knows I'm a fiend for for routine and, Let's and go morning. Deep. Let's go deep. Look at, and this is the cool thing, right? The miracle morning changes all the time based on where you are mm. in life, right? I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, right now, where I am in life, like what I, I love getting up early. Like I love four four o'clock now. For some Why? Reason. I, just, I think it's because I feel like I'm getting a lot more done. Um, I feel I can get into the office sooner as well. What I think, time are you in the office? Oh, I try to get in between eight and nine. So nothing great, but anything before nine, the phones on do not disturb. I don't like my miracle morning to be disrupted either. Um, so for me, it's as simple as, uh, yeah, 4 a.m. wake up, uh, cold shower straight away. That's always number one. So ha- six, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Yeah, so what I do actually just before the cold shower, I learned this literally, again, I've just tweaked it tweaked slightly it. since coming back from Guingana. I did a peak performance um, retreat and it was all around diaphragm, the ability to store oxygen in your diaphragm. So um, so it's a, it, it's 30 breaths like, have you heard of breath of fire? It's this breath like of fire, a, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of through your nasal... <laughs> like that so it's yeah. so oh, it's just all through your diaphragm yeah. so i'm just strengthening my diaphragm so i learned a lot around the, the stronger you hold that the strength in that the more oxygen you can hold throughout the day which when you get stressed that's your mm. little bank you can turn to so it calms your vagus nerve and stuff like that anyway so start with some breath work cold shower straight away um usually i'll hold it for the ability what i do now is like i'll, I'll sort of do the breath relax and on the exhale just hit it cold straight off the bat and then as I just try to relax the vagus nerve then. And I always think of those moments like I'm going to get some tough calls today or something bad will mm. happen. Um, it's just like this cold shower. It's, this is really painful right now for about five seconds. Just lean into it and then sort of breathe your way through it and then get through it. Then I'll turn it hot and then cold again and whatever. Um, big one for me is a skincare. Uh, yeah. I'm, all, I'm all about you the skin. You do look you good, look like, bro. <laughs> you look like you got a skincare. Bro, you all, good, bro. It's funny. All my, all my, well, imagine this, bro. Imagine being in a locker room. You know, you're 20 years old. You know, there's dudes in their 30, 35. Mask energy, right? And you pop out the moisturizer. <laughs> right? like, in the locker rooms, I used to get like all the time. You red light and everything? Bro, they'd, they'd be off me all the time. Like, fuck, what are you doing? <laughs> Anyways, uh, but it's funny, those same guys are like, bruh, you look, you look well, eh? Like, since you were... T- I'm like, bruh, all them times you used to pay me out moisturising, that's all right. Uh, but yeah, I always moisturised all that sort of stuff. Um, all natural, I don't, I don't touch any chemicals anymore. Um, and then chuck headphones in and then listen to, listen to a potty, like both sides or, or whatever, I, whatever I'm feeling. Sometimes I'll be like, yeah, I'm feeling like real estate chat. I'm feeling business or I'm feeling something really like spiritual or, or feminine, like yeah. just whatever, whatever I'm craving, a bit of, bit of love or something, Ooh, whatever, or whatever I'm craving. Yeah. Yeah. A bit, of, bit, of, bit of the secret, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, whatever, whatever I'm craving, I'll, I'll listen to it. Um, and then I do that when I make this smoothie, I'll give you this a recipe off air oh. if you want, but man, this smoothie never, oh. I've never missed a morning in about six years. Same smoothie. I take it with me overseas. Yeah. I got the setup at mum mum's place in Brizzy too. It just What's goes so everywhere. good about it? Why do you uh, why do you take it every morning? I, I think it it was funny, even at Eric that there was this dude who he gave his smoothie routine. And I think all it is is just energy. It just gives energy and if it's just got everything in it. Like there's a lot of good powders in it and all the natural stuff. And do you drink coffee? I do, well, I put a nab, a, a, like I'm talking like a drop of coffee in this smoothie because I have it before I train. Yeah. So I don't have pre-workout or anything. It's just that's my caffeine for the day. Yep. I'll, I'll actually put the shot inside this with yep. coconut oil um, inside the smoothie. And then, yeah, by the time the smoothie's done, I've, I've drunk it. Usually I can get through around a 40-minute potty on one and a half speed, which is good. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, go to the gym, do some mobility, uh, then always do some sort of weights, hypertrophy, uh, finish up with core, then I'll head to the beach on the Gold Coast. Very blessed. Live on the southern end of the coast. What's your favourite beach on the on the coast? Oh, I love I love I live in a suburb called Palm Beach. Yeah, so it's down the southern end, and uh, I've always really enjoyed it. Just because it's it's a bit more quieter, isn't it's it? It's very yeah. quiet. Yeah, it, it, there's limited parking, so you don't get all the 
the burly, burly, uh, burly, burly, you know, tourists, <laughs> tourists or anything like that. So it's cool. It's it's very peaceful. So yeah, I'll go for a dunk in the water. Then I'll um, do a yoga. I got a yoga flow. It's about ten minutes. Done that since all my injuries. It's really helped. Um, and then I'll meditate for ten to twelve minutes in the sun, direct sunlight. Um, which, at the beach. Uh, at the beach. Yeah, at the beach. So. Again, the, the benefits of direct sunlight. There's a lot of science behind it. Are you, are you looking in the sun? Yeah, yep. usually I'll close my eyes and the sun's just whack, whack will, on me. Will you also look in the sun as well, like directly into the no, sun? No, but I, first I, when I got back from Guingana, they actually mentioned that mm. that's um, that's actually all right. Like yeah. take your glasses off. Yeah, and look, look directly di- in the sun yeah, first Yeah, look directly, directly at it. So um, yeah, and then I'll sort of do my intentions for the day to finish on. Yeah. So, How many intentions do you write? Yeah, so uh, I've got myself, again, slightly tweaked now. I've got five good questions and I've got to save them on my phone, actually. This yeah, is, let's I've hear got, them. Yeah, so if you don't are, mind sharing yeah, them. Yeah, these are my five questions I ask myself each morning now and I, I love it. And I got this from, might have been Dean Graziosi, I think. I'm not sure though, but I've just kind of made it my own. And first question I ask myself after meditating is... Um, what am I grateful for today? Someone, something, and something about yourself. So three things. So what did some, you say for yourself today? Myself, I said, well, I was, I was a bit crook actually uh, yeah. after Eric. So I'm glad my body repaired itself. Yeah. So I uh, did natural ability on that. Uh, number two, where am I winning at the moment? Yep. So a bit of perspective and appreciation. Uh, where are you winning at the uh, I always reflect on the, the business side of things. Like yeah. again, with that was always a big one. Just lately, just because we've had some big wins with the business. Um, number three, what will I let go of today? Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes we, I feel, that was a good one to That's ask yourself. Really good sometimes one. we carry that deal that didn't go through or that client that pissed us That's off. Good. Or even someone that burnt us, mm. you know, whether it was work or outside of work. And we carry that, man, and it can stay with us. But like... And it can affect a, a lot of things. So, yeah, what, what will I let go of today? Um, number four, what does my ideal day ahead look like? Yep. So just anticipation and, and intent. So moving through the day with intent. And then the last one, what needs to be said at the end? Yeah. yeah. The end of the day or the end of your life? End of your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a little – it can always change. Yeah, again, all those things do is just kind of um, – just get the brain yeah, kind of anchors you into like anchors you into a bit, a bit of, of a thought, yeah. And I mean, after a bit of exercise, sun, breath work, again, man, that's my miracle morning. Go home, get dressed, chuck the black kit on, and <laughs> <laughs> listen, to, listen to both sides on the way. And I'm just oh, jacked dude. up, hey, ready to <laughs> ready so to go. I did some breath work with um, Beardle <clears throat> in Bali for the first time oh, yeah. ever. Yeah, yeah. And I full tripped out. Did you? I was like, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Did was you, it like that, that? Was it like that um, Wim Hof? Yeah. Cut? Yeah. Oh, no, I, that I was intense, the first, man. Yeah. That, that was, I remember the first time I did that, I, I was getting a bit tingly and um, No, like I was stuff. full tripped. Yeah. Full tri- <laughs> he, he, like he did it. We were sitting on the, we were sitting at the edge of this cold plunge, right? Mm. At the Airbnb <laughs> we are at. And he's sitting there. <sighs> and then he's sitting there. And he just goes full, <laughs> just into the water. I'm like, whoa, no this thing's cracking him out. Yeah. It's intense, yeah, man. Yeah, wow. Yeah. No, it's, um, again, I, all that sort of breath work stuff, I think it sounds like, oh, yeah, do your breath work and that. But, uh, again, what I learned at that retreat I went to was a lot of it is to do with, like, circulating oxygen and, mm. and just getting a storage of oxygen ready for, again, when stress comes because mm. it's coming. Yeah. Because um, you see, man, the... The things I've noticed in business, the best business operators I've seen, they're cool, calm, and collected. And always, always, every time. But people yeah. think, oh, they, yeah, they, yeah. they must just not go through stress. Man, everyone goes through stress. They just handle it better. They just handle it better. Emotional, and you, you always hear Simon Beard talk about it, the, the ability to regulate emotion. He calls it emotional IQ. Like being able to um, regulate your emotions, he reckons was a success to building culture <clears> things. <throat> Wow. Yeah. Just the ability to regulate in, in key times. I can times. see that. I yeah. can see that. I can yeah. see that in my own life, to be honest with you. The times mm. of where, I, where I'm on and I'm calm and collected is when I'm doing this. Mm. And then when I'm not, it's opposite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's time when, and it really comes out. I always 
really analyze myself when it's something that's gone wrong. Like how did I react in those moments? Because it's all well and good to be cool, calm and collected when everything's fine, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Correct. It's when it's when the business partner burnt you. It's when the client did the dirty on you. It's when your, your partner did something to you, mm. potentially, your mate or whatever. Doesn't matter how do you what? react then? Yeah. That's where it's at, I, I feel. So how long did it take you for that to click in your mind or have you always been like that level-headed dude? No, I wouldn't say, I mean, to be an athlete at that level, you, again, you have to be at level-headed. Yeah, because, you can't. Yeah, Man, it's one of the best life experiences to go through being an athlete because, again, like what, very grateful, like what other 19, 20-year-old like gets to, you know, hang out with all your mates who are, you know, and a lot of life experience, 25, 30 year olds every day. Um, and all day, every day, you're just, you're training, you're competing. Um, but you're on this roller coaster together like you wouldn't believe. Fans love you. They're, they're all over <laughs> you when you're winning. Yeah. And then they hate you the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and the media love you. You win man the match. Like, oh, Matt's drama. Well, next in line for Queensland. And then <laughs> what do you know? Next week, they're talking how he should be sacked. You know? <laughs> You just got to block it all out because, uh, again, it, people don't realize, man, it is a pressure cooker like you wouldn't believe. Like even every session you go into, you got someone you're chasing in front, but then there's a young kid chasing your back too. Always. Let's constantly, yeah. constantly always. So you're in this constant anxiety of like, man, you got to hold your spot. You got to perform. So mm. you, you get paid money to perform. Mm. And if you can't perform, you you not there so that's why sometimes you got to push through injuries and even though you go to any other job place if you can't do your job you get a doctor cert and you you get paid leave but <laughs> if you tell the coach mate you don't mind if i have <laughs> two weeks off eh? my shoulders playing up eh? it's just well sorry mate you snooze you lose so um yeah going through that whole pressure cooker of the of even the media as mm. well um not even to just sprinkle social media now these days mm. Um, yeah, you, you definitely grow a lot and you learn a lot. So when I transition out into business now, it's kind of like, well, yeah, some things don't always go to plan, but I feel like I've gone through a lot of different things when, when I was playing sport. So talk to us a little bit more about how um, you're a buyer's agent now, but you're wanting to be more, I guess, surface level uh, management, leading the business, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. What's led you down that track now? Or what's leading you down that track? Mm. I think this is a good one. Like I know you've got a lot of listeners in the real estate space and I see two paths in the real estate world. Like mm. there's there's more the technician path and there's more the manager path, I reckon. Mm. Mm. And what I mean is there's your trading time for money and like a lot of the great agents I know who are earning some serious money too, they're amazing technicians, which is awesome. Like, that's awesome. And it's just choosing which one mm. I think is best for you. So what I mean by that is te a technician is someone who can trade effort for dollars. And all the best agents I know, man, they work hard. They work hard, which is epic. And they get what they deserve. And that's the cool thing around this industry. You get paid on the effort you can do and provide the world 100%. as well. So. You, the the GCI and all that it, it's it's a direct reflection of the effort you're putting in yeah. at the end of the day, um, but then what I've also noticed in this game talking to some some owners who are more behind the scenes, um, they're also earning some amazing coin. But what they've done is they're leveraging their efforts into more people to build the business. Build the people, the people will build the business. Mm. Yeah. Um, not one and, and again, I feel it's hard to wear both hats of the manager and the technician. Mm. And I feel the best agents are really good technicians and the best managers are really good managers. I haven't seen many who can do, do both. They transition. Like I remember hearing the other week, he had Marty Fox on who I've always looked up to. He turned from a technician to an amazing manager now and he's, he's scaling mm. things out and more of a CEO role. Um, Dane Atherton on the Gold Coast, um, who's a weapon, you know. Oh, man. He's an absolute machine. Yeah. Um, but he's he's a, he's one of the best managers I've ever seen of his of people. Um, but then I also heard Matt Pilios the other way, who I've always like, mm. unreal technician, one of the mm. best, unreal. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. Very different. different. Different, different, but both can earn ridiculous amounts. And, and it just depends what fulfills you. Mm. I actually get a lot more what I've realized on the journey out of, seeing my team 
become the technicians and them achieving goals for their families and their kids and stuff like that. And I think when I peel it back to my identity piece again, I think it's just the sport thing. I was always captain and stuff like that. I loved getting everyone up to play. Mm. It's nearly like I'm, I'm moving from the player to play a coach to now I want to be the the owner of the organisation to help drive the people to I make a movement mm. um, kind of thing because I can't wear all the hats and no. that's something I have been doing because, I mean, I'm still in startup phase. Yeah. How long have you been no. running for? Mate, we're just coming up to three and a half. Uh, fourth year will be in September. Fourth year, September. Yeah. That's epic. That is yeah. epic. Yeah. And most of your stuff we're chatting off air is owner-occupier based in the Gold Coast for those that don't know. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And um, a lot of it has been, again, my family, my dad was – uh, a garbo like he collected wow. rubbish and my mum worked at the hotel at the travel lodge of roma street just around the oh, corner yeah. actually and um yeah so my, the business was never in the in the family whatsoever very hard working um dad was from poland mum was from philippines so didn't grow up with much was from western brizzy and um hence the good skin and, yeah, <laughs> it's good and um so yeah what, what i try to say there all the time is business I, you just learn it like mm, that's what fly, i've learned I, I i i started off as a technician and moved through the journey and what i'm super passionate about now is especially in the buyers agency space it's epic it, it's all of a sudden like you realize it's cool now to be a buyer's agent yeah. like never but used it's to. fucking hard it's it's tough yeah it's it's tough it's tough, man. And same as oh, I used to be a sales agent as well. Uh, Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to be a sales agent. Oh, uh, McGrath. Really? Th- thank God you moved. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the light. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. I was, uh, I was a sales agent. Yeah. So yeah. again, I've, I've learned the, the technician effort, like mm. man, respect big time. You want to learn a job. You want to become successful. I think you have to do real estate sales for 12 months. Just, you do, just you for, gotta, just, it's like the laborer's job. You got to do you it. Gotta, it's like that same experience where you just got to do the you shit. You got to do the shit. You, gotta, work. you have to go you through, through it. No, you no. got to understand rejection, being able mm. to talk to people, make cold calls. And I'm just and thinking back to my McGrath days. I sat at this desk, right? And next to me, <laughs> next to me, it was like a revolving door. Yeah. I, in, in 12 months that I was there, I had six people sit next to me, six or seven. Mm. Did you? Most of them lasted 60 days <laughs> or, less, or less. So it was, it was really funny. But that, that's what I, I've, I've really noticed on the journey is that, I don't know, the difference in separating the two. And then in the buyer's agency space, what I find, and this is a lot of advice um, I give to a lot of new buyer's agencies, you will craft your path into either a mm. technician or a manager. And same as real estate sales, you will mm. craft your path because just because you're a baker doesn't mean you'll have a good bakery shop. Yes, correct. Just because you're a real estate agent gun doesn't mean if you want to open up a real estate office, you're going to have a great office. Same mm. as buyer's agents. You're seeing a lot that are coming in as business owners. If you're a good buyer's agent, doesn't mean you're going to have a good buyer's agency business because the sport of being a buyer's agent and the sport of owning a business are two different sports. Yeah. It's just like saying you want to be good at playing tennis and you want to be pro at playing basketball. Yeah. I think to be good, you've got to choose one and go hard. At, mm. at that so that's what i'm really learning and, and trying to show my team too is there's a lot of effective ways that you can scale uh, effectively staying in your what's called i th- call it your creative zone of genius yeah 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 what um what's your blueprint or recipe the sharma model that you could share for buyers agents to generate business crack the code buy mm. properties what do you have a blueprint a system a model that suits you? Yeah. Uh, my advice to any buyer's agent is, and this is some advice I got early on as well, is if you're starting out, you, you want to find clients and then you want to find property for those clients. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. <clears throat> and that's all you should be doing. So how do you find clients, number one? So 80% of your time should be done on lead generation activities. So trying to figure out who are the key stakeholders who could potentially give you business obviously a lot when starting out to buyers agencies potentially you know your your brokers um referral partners like real estate agents is another one and then your personal network i remember thinking when i started i used to write down in this little black book literally you just hear it all the time like oh so and so is thinking of buying a house i'd write their name down like when you think about it there are that many people looking to buy a property Mm. so that's really where you should just start in all honesty and 
I used to come up with this method. I called it the lost lead approach. Sometimes you've got to take a loss on your first few leads. Remember my first lead, I did it for like 500 bucks or something. I just wanted to get a foot in the door. But then that one lead further down the track actually referred me someone because of business. My first, I think, three leads I did for next to nothing. But what I did was I leveraged those opportunities into the hope of more. Testimonials, not only written, but I got video ones. I used them as content as well, like the purchases I made. Those agents who I worked with on those ones, they started seeing what I did there and they started referring me. So all of a sudden three clients, which I probably effectively lost money on at the start, I seen it as a positive game because that in the long game, Mm. it actually put me in a far better position. So it's called the lost lead approach. The lost lead approach. I I can relate Mm. to that. I've I've last night. Yes. Yesterday. Realistically. Yeah. 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 So, um, I, I, I guess with that one, in, in terms of leveraging, how would you how would you leverage now if you were to sell a property? Sorry, not buy, sell a property, buy a property. Mm-hmm. How are you leveraging? I think relationships is it's huge. It mm. is every everything. And my advice to not only my team and why we've been able to get so good traction on the Gold Coast is real estate agents are your clients. They are. You've got two sets of clients if you're a buyer's agent got the real estate agents and you've got your buyers and both are treated differently. Both have different dialogue methods. You need to give both of them. Both have different ways of communication styles too. <laughs> Fucking oath that is. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So that's what I've realized is you need to learn the art of your two clients mm. and work very hard. So I used to have a key, again, my OCD, I used to have a method of building my clients with agents Again, not for business, for relationship growth. Yeah. What I used to do is I do my sourcing calls. So, you know, hey, mate, it's Matt here from the Strama Group, blah, blah, blah. Seen you sold, whatever, mate, awesome. I, mean, I stroke the ego. Oh, he's at the start. A little stroke. Got to add value. Got to stroke Mate, the what about that? Did, was that a three bed or a four? Was that three? Mate, how did she get that sale price? Good job. Whatever. Just chew the fat, whatever. Uh, and just off the cuff. Uh, oh, by the way, always start with, hey, I know you're busy because they are. They're busy. Don't piss them off. Don't like. Yeah. Don't be that buyer's agent. You just choose the area off. Mm. Just, mate, I know you're busy. Just quickly, I got this client. Blah blah blah. I'm um, looking for this, that, and that. You got anything? No. Nah. Mm. All good, man. Hey, keep up the great work. Then, if I, it was a bit of an energy there, or whatever, we just got along. I'll check his next two open homes. Mm. I'd go to the open home, meet him in person, and the goal for me was never to talk real estate. It was just chew the fat and chat around mate it sounds like he likes afl which I, you know i'll do i'll try and chat around stuff with afl or it might be a female and like she's a mum, and like oh how are you juggling being a mum? and so again the, again the art was just building genuine relationships not doing it out of like a um a passive like you know, i'm just trying to infiltrate people mm. it was literally i wanted to get to know these people on a level where if i know in six months time when i call them when i do have a lot of clients finally on my book I'm going to get in the doors a lot better because I didn't waste their time. Yeah. I respected their time. <clears throat> there was a little stroke of ego here and there. Um, but also I understood uh, as well what they're, they're busy. They're trying to get deals done. I want to be a facilitator, not a hindrance. Hmm. I, mean, I think I, that's awesome. I can relate to that as well. And I think just sharing my experience as well mm. that helped me source properties and build relationships is doing something like the podcast yeah, and it's like true. how do you add value to these people yes so that you can bring the playing field down huge oh so like just think like for me the podcast is my vehicle but you might have your own vehicle somebody else might have their own mm. little thing um, one of my biggest tips for any buyers agents listening or even sales agents could get a bit out of this too is across our team i always give that exact point mate you made adding value how are you adding value to buyers agents just like you are to your clients agents need that too so i might have went to you know three burley street auction i love getting out to auctions again it's it's good to get your face out there live market feedback as well so my process there was i'd go to the auction chew the fat with everyone who's there you see auctions mate everyone's there Mm. agents are there auctioneers are there office is there whole office is there get a chin wag with everyone shake a hand it's awesome um quick little prospect around two on properties that they got coming on it's it's the best um so auctions are very good get some footage i tag them all as well they reshare it yeah. yep 
Um, I'd leave and then I'd do a video market report like, hey, it was just that one, uh, three Burley Street, Burley Heads, uh, three bidders over, two mil, ended up selling for 2.6. Pretty good area for the result. Well done. Um, you know, Troy Fitz, Ray White or whatever, Lacey mm. West, Will West, whatever. Um, so then again, they target. But then the key is I'd start thinking who are the three agents who would find this relevant? So I'd call the other three agents in Burley, say, oh, brother. That's smart. Brother, I don't know if you know, Burley Street just sold 2.6, had three over four. Uh, man, it's was, it was pretty good, I eh? Just want to let you know. It's like, mate, they love it because they're straight onto their pipelines yeah. who they're working on. So that's a big That's tip. really smart, especially yeah. if the agents don't have a relationship with the other agent. And they all they, hate each other. So. <laughs> and they don't get prices and you can be that connection. That's I remember I used to fake being a... Being, I'd go on a different number when I used to work at my garage. <laughs> Get some sales <laughs> yeah. info from someone oh, else. So, but, yeah, it's doggy. You dog. know, yeah. <laughs> I, like, like half my competitors are probably listening to this. I hate you all. <laughs> <laughs> it's all and that's what I mean. The buyer's agent, though, uh, you can add value you to all of collab, them. Yeah. yeah, you can collab. So we, I always see it as good cop, bad cop. A buyer's yeah. agent, they're always a good cop. We are, aren't we? Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah always. I yeah. think real estate agents just need to go to that question three, which what do they need to release for their day? Yeah, what <laughs> do so they need to let go of? <laughs> yeah. eh? 100%. Uh, I say this to everyone. A good buyer's agent are usually the, the good guys and girls of real estate who didn't have that, that, <laughs> that who didn't have the backstab. <laughs> they're the ones who are good buyer's agents. <laughs> no, right, yeah, no, nah, but it's literally I respect all – I literally respect all the real estate agents on the coast because, again, because I've lived and breathed mm. being – it's bloody tough. Mm. Um, so if you can literally add value to them, little things, take off admin. Say, man, w- our team will sort all the paperwork. D- we'll do all the DocuSign, everything for you. Um, just want – you know, so, again, thinking in that mentality, they are your client. Mm. They are your clients. So you got always got two sets of clients if you're a buyer's agent. Question for you. I, I'm moving more from that technical to to the next to mm-hmm. the next spot. I've obviously got a I've got a good great team under me. I've got, you know, we're about to put on our six associate. Um but I don't want to be listing and selling majority of it. Yeah. I want my team doing it. Yeah. What are you doing when obviously you now you're having people call you mm-hmm. and say, hey, Matt, we want to work with you. Are you still handling every single one or are you mm. starting to palm? Really good question. This is the fine art of, of the Passover. Mm. This, this, is, this is what I need to know. This, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is playing what's in front. Yeah, Give playing. me the ball, but I'll, I'll set you up. And it's a fine art. It is mm. a very fine art. And it's taken me six to 12 months to kind of build this out. And I think it starts on the messaging of where the lead enters the pipeline. Okay. So what I mean is, uh, again, I love business. I love developing systems and processes, all those sorts of things. There should be a clean system and process from the moment a lead enters your funnel, top funnel, right up into bottle fu- bottom funnel, which I call, say, settlement. Yeah. Clean process. So what I mean is lead entry comes in, they get a first con- – lead entry goes into the data – First contact call task gets automated. First contact call called. There's a script, blah, blah, blah. Pre-meetings booked in, calendar invites sent. You know, so every little detail of our process is is ingrained in there. At the start, I was 100% owner of that whole funnel. Mm. As you scale, you find the right people in the right seats. Similar footy. I was playing all the positions at the start and as you get better, you realize where your strengths are. Mm. So you get a winger, you start to get a hooker, you get a, a prop get a back rower and then you start formulating the side. So it's awesome that you've gone down a path now getting the right people. So it sounds like the first step is getting the right people for the right seats. So where I see some people get it wrong when they're scaling is they're hiring people for the sake of adding capacity, not for alleviating roles. Mm. So what I mean is I needed to let go of, I was really good at first contact call, Mm. but I hated all the booking in and admin and, everything so i outsourced that got an admin person blah 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 built it out like that then as more leads started coming in um i was starting that was starting to take up a lot of my time so i started getting someone in for the first contact calls qualifying calls stuff like that what we've been able to manage and slowly do now is when it comes 
to sign on meeting that don't have to see me. They can see. So we could potentially have four meetings at once rather than that. That used to be four of me going to mm. every single one of them. What I noticed the big tweak was, was what was the expectation set as soon as the lead come in? The Srama group is a group of amazing buyers agents on the Gold Coast. Previously, it was the Srama group was Matt Srama. Mm. Yeah. You, so how, how, what happens if someone calls you and they say, hey, Matt, I want to work with you, mm. but you're not in the position where you might not want to work with that mm -hmm. particular client because maybe for any what reason. Yeah. How do you pass that on? Mm. What are you saying to that client? Yeah. And again, why I love a system and process, no one comes through the qualifying call. And that qualifying call does a lot of the vetting. Got you. You know, there's a lot of good questions in there. You know, we don't have to go too in depth in that, but all the great agents who would listen to this have gotten really good questions that peel the onion back, whether yep. it's a hot buyer or a cold buyer. If it's a hot buyer and it's still maybe you don't have capacity for them or whatever, in that qualifying call, being able to train the team in a way where it's like, or it could be me sometimes taking that call. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, your criteria, that's awesome. I, I definitely feel we can add value. You're going to be really suited. Ah, that's to Kev. You're going to be really suited to Kev because Kev looks after that area really, really well. Um, or, you know, Dan actually heads up that department in that area. Mm. What I'll do is I'll actually connect you up and, and mm. Dan will, but then the onus is on you as a founder to make sure when it's passed, that level of service stays yep. high. So stays high. So don't lose that client. Don't lose that client. Yeah. Um, and what I've noticed is, look, there may be the odd one here and there that says that. But again, if they're feeling like it's the, the experience is synonymous regardless where it goes, it's not about the person. It's around the experience because mm. people are paying to get a job done. They're not paying to so much so, hey, I want to work with Kev. It's like, hey, I've got a pain. I've heard mm. your business has a solution. Your mm. fee's this, I'll pay that, get me the solution, get the solution, they're happy. At the end of it, you realize people are paying for a solution. They're not actually paying for the person. Mm. And it's one thing I think real estate agents can't let go of sometimes. You've got to let go to grow. So you have to make that decision. You're not always the most needed person. Definitely. Not always, you're not yeah. always, yeah. But you are required at certain points. And sometimes what I notice, probably the best way to scale in your position could be, I call it red zone chats. So, red zone chats. Red zone. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about that. So red zone chats are the teams work their way up field. <laughs> teams got you to the to the eighty meter mark. It's fifth and last. <laughs> Chip and yeah. They need they need your little expertise to get the repeat set or, or get yeah. this over the line. That little stitch. Little stitch. So again, imagine you could do four or five red zone chats in an hour. So yeah. they're the chats where it's like you might be needed. Mm. Just your little bit of expertise that just that it little is hard rubber, to that little. It's hard to train that sort of stuff. Yeah. That comes with experience. Yeah. You can yep. train people to get you upfield though. You can. So again, I had three red zone chats on the way here um, that I helped the team with. And now it's it's around giving them the confidence though to have those chats too. And you've got to take it sometimes. Look, I could just pick up the phone and do it myself. I could. And sometimes I will if it's very important. But sometimes it's like, well, if you're going to let someone fish, don't take the rod off them. Mm, just let them go true, fish. And be okay to let them fish at the level they currently are and, and make the mistakes. Bro, this podcast rem is fucking fire. Because remember, we were them too. That's right. That's right. We were them too. We were. There's nothing worse than a micromanager saying, nah, bro, give me the rod. Yeah. I'll do it for you. How is that person going to grow into the best version of themselves? Because I call it ROTI, return on time invested. And the more time you give someone up front, yeah. it's going to – win back time over here it's just very hard it's it's a slog here mm. but you give someone the confidence and just believe in them and give them the training give them the scripts like i record calls and we we role play um it's fucking annoying you know that you have the thought they're not good as me what but they do end up being better if not better yeah it's just you need to allow the time and and space were you were you doing self-development like audiobooks books and that sort of stuff while you were an athlete yeah, I, I did at the back when I started okay. having injuries, yeah. I was going to say, your mind seems very, very switched on. Like I just said, just then, this this, this podcast is straight fucking fire. Like, there's, there's, so really, there's just love nugget, there's yeah. nuggets of gold being dropped 24-7. No, I'm going to be re-listening to this. Yeah. And I very rarely re-listen to a podcast. So, mm. um, mate, there's... um. 
how have you been able to switch into that gear, switch into gear and go, you know what, I'm going all in on this? Mm. Again, maybe it was from the, um, the sports side of things that a career won't last forever. I think I've had that realisation. Fuck, it's true, isn't it? it? It's so true, man. The reality is what the three of us are doing right now mm. may not be here in 12 months. No. Mm. It's not guaranteed. It's not. No, it's definitely not guaranteed. We all, all three of us might delve into something different too. Like we're talking off air, like we've all got different ambitions. <laughs> like <laughs> I doubt we will be in yeah. 12 months, the three of us. But isn't that the cool thing though? Mm. Like it's like who who knows? So I think the ability to give it your all in the moment now is what's important because, again, if you've got anxiety on the future or depression about the past, man, the, the, the moment is now. And that's what I learned as an athlete is you drop the ball in the past and you're worrying about your performance in the future, you miss the opportunity right in front of you mm. in game day, game day because the best athletes, they play in the moment. Mm. They play what is in front of their eyes I've seen so many players miss opportunities, myself included, because you were, your thought was way over here. Mm. The best athletes play it, literally, it sounds cliche, play by play. So I think the same comes in life and in business too. You just got to take it day by day and mm. give it a... And play by play, like play hour by, by hour. Hour by hour. Oh, man, this industry is minute by minute, eh? Like, <laughs> so like, yeah. With footy, for example, you've got your set plays mapped out in training. You can play them on game day. What, how are you structuring your set plays in business? How are you doing your calendar each day, yep. each week, goals, yep. action tasks? Oh, don't get me started on, on calendar. I, uh, I, love a good, I love a good calendar, man. Um, so I think the big one is when I peel back the calendar, I'm very structured with calendar. Um, my assistant loves it because it just everything just funnels where it needs to go. Two big tips around calendar. First is understand what your three big rocks are. So your role right now, you have three key tasks. That's it. So for instance, again, sport analogy, I got this from sport. I was a dummy half. My role was good service to the halves, tie up the middle, like yeah. we we're very defensively tight and get us to the points at play we mm. needed. That was it. That's all I needed to do. Do my job. That's <clears> all I needed to do. Now, my role for where I am now, at the start, it was fine clients, fine pro, all it's that everything. sort of, You know, it's everything. But now I've identified just three things. There's a million things on the to-do list we all have. Yeah. Three key things. So for me, it's revenue generate. So revenue generate is tasks that will generate revenue. Consider stuff like this where I'm meeting on platforms and opening top of funnel. Mm. So meeting with revenue generating people. Mm. So through this podcast, I could... Someone might follow me that connects up. Hey, I've got a client down in Melbourne, whatever. Correct. Mm. You just never, you have to do activities like this and build your network. And now the three of us will stay connected, I'm sure. You 100%. know, so that's revenue generate, corporate partner relationship, revenue convert, red zone chats. Yeah. So ah. revenue in the business, converting clients. Again, maybe an objection come and one of my team are like, hey, this person said fee objection or whatever jump on the phone and I'll try and convert that to, to revenue in the business. So revenue generate, revenue convert, and then lead, just lead, lead, the, lead, lead the team. Anything to do with training or, and that's it. So then in my calendar though, I've got little set, it says actually RevCon, RevGen, lead. lead. RevCon, RevGen, lead. RevCon, RevGen, lead. So when our requests come in to catch up, um, you said the time, I was like, perfect, that Wednesday mornings from 8 to 10 is always rev gen. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's kind of like, well, boom, slots in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if someone reached out for uh, an OFI, a really hot off market, that would go into RevCon and my assistant slots mm. it in. A team meeting one-on-one, -on -one, that goes into the lead block. So my assistant funnels all the emails and inquiries that come through, then if it's, I like it that. slots into the, what? the space Stru structure. Mm. Because again, if you've got no structure, we become busy being busy. Yep. Yeah, and at do. the end of the week, as agents, buyers, agents in this industry, we're all busy. Everyone's running around flustered and oh, they've got one hand on the phone and <laughs> you know they've got the coffee in this hand. Like, bro, it's been the busiest week. But you look on the calendar, there's a lot of just not busy coffee. being busy. Yeah, yeah. But did you move the needle big? So I think that is a huge one. Understanding what your three rocks are, then creating a calendar that matches your 
your output and your and your goals yeah my last question for you and this is not uh, this is for anyone that's starting out either as a real estate agent buyer's agent or even an entrepreneur that's starting Mm. off on their own business what would be your key advice or what would you have done differently in your first year in business biggest learnings biggest learnings I'd say definitely the understanding which path I wanted to go down in terms of technician versus manager. Mm. There's another really good concept called the E-Myth Revisited. It's a book, the E-Myth Revisited. Mm. Super basic, but understands the layers of, of business and, and building that that bakery. And if you are a baker right now. E-Myth, sorry? The E-Myth Revisited. Revisited, beautiful. Yep. Um, and just understanding what business is all around. Mm. I think that's number one. And then deciding what path I'd go down. But I think the second one to finish on would definitely be reflecting on sport, reflecting on business. And I'd I'd say this to a lot of people right now is that what I noticed the best do in sport and what I noticed the best do in business is exactly the same. And it's one thing I'm really mindful of now is that they, they see with their mind see, with, they their see with their mind so what i mean is like like our eyes are just a mechanism to see this is what i believe is true our eyes are just a mechanism to see like we should be seeing through our mind if if our mind is blind to the possibility our eyes would be blind to the opportunity mm. Mm. so i think a lot of people don't even believe it up here yet they're trying to make it happen through here gotcha so the best in sport they already know it's it's happening up here and i've, I've analyzed a lot of key business people they're they're seeing things through their mind yeah. so when they're looking out in the world they're spotting the opportunities because it's been consistently thought about manifested yes and, and thought about so that would be my biggest takeaway if i was to go back i'd do a lot more work on visualizing success before it even happens yes I my last it. question to you maddie is what are you currently now visualizing to mm. manifest what's the next the next rock yep the next the next rock uh, i guess i always peel it back into facets of life right for for health it's i've gone down this path of yeah just trying to improve energy definitely what i'm manifesting little things can i tweak one percent it's again using natural products produce is stepped mm. up looking where I get my vegetables and, and meats and everything from now. So I'm definitely stepping up the energy side. Um, and then in the business side, I, th- I think what I'm manifesting a lot is the ability to add impact to a wider scale. So what I mean is I love the buyer's agency space. I think it's amazing how many are coming through, but I'm also noticing a need for solid mentorship in the in the mm. space too yeah, because it's, true. So, it's yeah. so fresh it's yeah. awesome there's no set and forget model like i noticed in the sales space there's nearly a model where it's you know the associate come into you know there's like a clean path that a lot of people do follow in businesses but everyone what i've noticed in ba they're doing it differently which is so awesome different, yeah. yeah which is awesome so i think for a lot of new people in the space it's very hard to kind of learn from someone in the space who's done things because there isn't many Mm. there isn't many so that's what i'm passionate about because how can i've always thought to myself how can i impact more people around you know nationwide it's not through having more strama group it's potentially having more impact through other buyers agents so then they're spreading their learnings to to more people Mm. so i'm just trying to manifest i guess how can i impact and create high leverage with my time um, versus the impact uh, I create because just to finish on lads, my favorite is the more impact you create, the more income you'll make. Oh, yes. I like mm, don't focus on the income. The impact will be a, a byproduct, you know. Focus on the impact, the byproduct will be the income. Mm. Mate, thank you so much. That was one of the was best awesome. podcasts no, I love I've done. Thank you. No, I, pre- I really, really appreciate, appreciate that. Appreciate it. And you. as a fellow uh, podcaster, you know, on my podcast, I always think, a lot comes down to the the host and the questioner. It's, man, it's been one of my favorite too, and that's a credit to to you lads. Yeah. You know what you're doing, and every app I listen to, like yeah, you're really good at digging digging yeah. deeper, man. <laughs> Appreciate it, my man. Thank you All so right, much. Thank you. Holy smokes, we actually made it. Sorry to interrupt the podcast. But I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of our listeners, past and present, because we've officially hit 
50,000 followers on Instagram. It's blown my mind to see the, how we've been able to build one of the biggest real estate brands in the country just off starting a podcast where we interviewed people starting in Zoom. So off the back of that, building all these relationships and having people know us in Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, we now have access to all these off-market properties which I can't service with my current clients. We've got more properties than I have clients. So if you are looking to buy your next home to live in or investment, please reach out. Additionally, I know Kevin is the king of Kellyville, but if you're not based in Kellyville and you are looking to sell your home, we know all the best agents and, the, and could put you in with the right fit that suits you. So just wanted to give you a quick shout out, guys. Thank you so much for the support up until now. Both sides 50, baby.